This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Elizabeth Wilcox. The Outdoor Girls of Deepdale, or Camping and Tramping for Fun and for Health by Laura Lee Hope. Chapter 11. The Barking Dog. Disappointment and not a little worriment held the four girls silent for a moment. Then Betty, feeling that it was her place to assume the leadership, said, "'Are you sure, little boy? A man told us, at the last dividing of the roads, to take the left, as that led to Rockford.' "'Well, he didn't know what he was talking about,' asserted the little chap with the supreme confidence of youth. "'To get to Rockford, you've got to go back.' "'All that distance!' cried Grace. "'We'll never make it in time.' "'Isn't there a shorter way, some crossroad we can take?' inquired Betty. "'Who's got the candy?' inquired the little chap, evidently thinking that he'd already earned some reward. "'Here,' said Grace helplessly, holding out an almost emptied box. "'But please, please don't tell us we're lost.' "'Oh, you ain't exactly lost,' exclaimed the urchin with a grin. "'I live just down the road a piece, and it's only a mile to Bakersville.' "'That's a good town. They've got a moving picture show there. I went once.' "'Did you indeed?' said Betty. "'But we can't go there. Isn't there some way of getting to Rockford without going all the way back to the fork? Why, it's miles and miles.' "'I wish I had that man here who directed us wrongly,' exclaimed Molly with a flash of her dark eyes. "'I'd—I'd I'd make him get a carriage and drive us to your aunt's house, Betty.' "'That would not be revenge enough,' declared Grace. "'He ought to be made to buy us each a box of the best chocolates.' "'Nothing like making the punishment fit the crime,' murmured Betty. "'Say, are you play-actors?' demanded the boy, who had stood in open-mouthed wonder during this dialogue. The girls broke into peals of merry laughter that in a measure served to relieve the tension on their nerves. "'Now do please tell us how to get to Rockford,' begged Molly, when they had quieted down. "'We must be there tonight.' "'Well, you can get there by going on a mile further "'and taking the main road that goes through Sayreville,' said the boy, his mouth full of candy. "'Would that be nearer than going back to where we made the mistake?' Betty asked. "'Yep, a lot nearer. Come on, I'll show you as far as I'm going.' And the boy started off as though the task— or shall I say pleasure, of leading four pretty girls, was an everyday occurrence. "'We can never get there before dark,' declared Molly. "'Oh, yes, we will,' said Betty hopefully. "'We can walk faster than this.' "'If you do, I'll simply give up,' wailed Grace. "'These shoes!' And she leaned against a tree. And to the eternal credit of the other girls, be it said that they did not remark, "'I told you so.' Silently and unconcernedly, the snub-nosed boy led them on. Finally he came to his own home, and rather ungallantly did not offer to go further. "'You just keep on going about half a mile,' he said, "'and you'll come to a crossroad.' "'I hope it isn't too cross,' murmured Grace, with a grey face. "'Huh?' The boy looked at her wonderingly. "'I mean not cross enough to bite,' she went on. "'You turn to the left,' the boy continued, "'and keep straight on till you get to Watson's Corners.' Then you turn to the right, keep on past an old stone church, turn to the right, and that's a straight road to Rockford. He looked curiously at Grace, as though in doubt as to her sanity. A cross road, he murmured. Gracious, we'll never remember all that, exclaimed Amy. I have it down, said practical Betty, as she rapidly wrote in her notebook. I'm sure we can find it. Come on, girls. Have another candy, invited Grace, hospitably extending the now nearly depleted box. "'Sure, thanks,' exclaimed the boy, but he backed quickly away from her. Her joke had fallen on a suspicious mind, evidently. The girls trudged on, rather silent now, for somehow the edge of their enjoyment seemed to have been taken off. But still they were not discouraged. They were true outdoor girls, and they knew, even if worse came to worse, and darkness found them far from their destination and Betty's aunt's house, that no real harm could come to them. Successfully they found the various points of identification mentioned by the freckled boy, and at last they located a signpost that read, Five miles to Rockford!' Five miles!' exclaimed Grace with a tragic air. "'We can never do it!' "'We must,' declared Betty firmly. "'Of course we can do it. Why, even with going out of the, our way as we did, we won't have covered more than eighteen miles today, and we set twenty as an average.' 
but this is the first day, said Molly. We can, we must get to Rockford tonight, insisted Betty. Rather hopelessly, they tramped on. The sun seemed to sink with a surprising rapidity after going to a certain point in the western sky. It's dropping faster and faster all the while, cried Amy, as they watched it from a crest of the road. Never mind, June evenings are the longest of the year, consoled Betty. They hurried on. The sun sank to its nightly rest amid a bed of golden green, purple, pink, and olive clouds, and there followed a glorious maze of colours that reached high up toward the zenith. "'Girls, we simply must stop and admire this, if it's only for a minute,' exclaimed Grace. "'Isn't that wonderful?' and she pointed a slender hand, beautified by exquisitely kept nails, toward the gorgeous sky picture. "'Every minute counts,' remarked practical Betty. Yet she knew better than to worry her friends. The glow faded, and again the girls advanced. From the fields came the lowing of the cows as they waited impatiently for the bars of the pasture to be let down. A herd of sheep was driven along the road, raising a cloud of dust. From farmhouses came the barking of dogs and the not unmusical notes of conch or tin horns, summoning the men folks to the evening meal. "'Girls, we're never going to make it in time,' exclaimed Grace as the sky darkened. We must see if we can stop at one of these houses overnight, and she pointed to a little hamlet that they were approaching. Grace, exclaimed Betty, Aunt Sally would be worried to death if we didn't come after she expected us. Then we must send her word. I can't go another step. They all paused irresolutely. They were in front of a big white house, a typical country house. Betty glanced toward it. It's too bad, she said. I know just how you feel, and yet can we go up to one of these places, perfect strangers, and ask them to keep us overnight? It doesn't seem reasonable. Anything is reasonable when you have to, declared Molly. I'll ask, she volunteered, starting toward the house. The worst they can say is no, and maybe we can hire a team to drive us to Rockford if they can't keep us. I can drive. Well, we'll ask anyhow, agreed Betty rather hopelessly. She hardly knew what to do next. As they advanced toward the house, the savage barking of a dog was heard, and as they reached the front gate, the beast came rushing down the walk, while behind him lubbered a farmer, shouting, "'Here, come back, down, Nero! Don't mind him, ladies,' he added. "'He won't hurt you.' But the aspect and the savage growls and barks of the creatures seemed to indicate differently, and the girls shank back. Betty, reaching in her bag, drew out the nearly emptied olive bottle for a weapon. "'Don't hit him, don't hit him,' cried the farmer. "'That will only make him worse. Come back here, Nero.' "'Run, girls, run,' begged Amy. "'He'll tear us to pieces,' and she turned and fled. End of chapter 11